One of the great blessings of a conference like this is that we're not only reminded of the great heritage that we've received from the Puritans, but we also find ourselves challenged and motivated to pick up the torch that they have passed down to us to follow in their footsteps and by God's grace to be found faithful in this generation. And that's why I'm so excited about this conversation that we get to have this afternoon, because we're going to unpack some of those practical implications of what it means to pursue Christ passionately, to stand for him boldly, just as many generations of faithful believers have done throughout church history. As I was thinking about this conversation, I was reminded of another pair of pastors from church history, both of them also named John, both of them pastors who have been mentioned at this conference, John Owen and John Bunyan. And even though they had very different ministries, one thing that sticks out in my mind about them was their deep appreciation and affection, their respect for one another. In fact, when John Owen defended John Bunyan before King Charles II, Owen famously said that he would gladly exchange all of his academic learning, all of his accolades and achievements if he could simply reach men's hearts the way that Bunyan did when he preached. So there was this evident gratitude for one another. So I wanted to begin this afternoon by asking you men, in that same spirit, 350 years later, as you look back through the decades of ministry in different parts of the country, Minneapolis and Los Angeles, all the battles that you fought against things like easy believism and the prosperity gospel and cultural evils like abortion, what are some of the things that you have appreciated and given the Lord thanks for about each other mm -hmm. and your respective ministries? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be happy to go first. Um, that's a pretty easy question for me to answer. I appreciate everything about him. <laughs> and I, I mean that sincerely. Um, well, pre appreciate and agree with wouldn't be the same. <laughs> I, I just said what you told don't me to say. Don't want to lose your train of thought. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> um, I first found myself uh, in a controversy in which I had his support for the first time when I wrote um, The Gospel According to Jesus. Absolutely. And I knew I had stepped on the air hose in Dallas, <laughs> and there were people hyperventilating all over the place. And John robustly came to come alongside and um, affirm what I had said in that book. And that's the first time that I recall an open, public affirmation of the truth, which I felt was lost to much of evangelicalism, and it was a huge, huge issue. So um, that set a trajectory for me of trust in Him. And from there, look, I am a um, secret Christian hedonist. No longer. I just came out of the closet. <laughs> as far as I can define it. <laughs> and I would define it as, as simply coming off what you said last night. I think everything in our Christian experience is related to affections. Um, Paul says, if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're damned. It's frightening. He says, people will, 2 Thessalonians 2, 
perish for lack of love of the truth. That's right. You have to love the Lord. You have to love the gospel. Yep. You have to love the truth written. You have to love the truth incarnate. And that love is unnatural. Mm -hmm. And that's what regeneration does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the new heart. Mm -hmm. That's the new spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, that's the love He sheds abroad in the heart. And it goes heavenward, and it goes out, and it, it goes everywhere. So, but, so th that is, to me, what you've been saying all these years, is if you love God, He is the one in whom you delight. And all joys are found in connection with Him. And apart from Him, there is no real joy. So um, I'm, I'm a disciple of, of that reality and thankful to you uh, for clarifying in so many wonderful ways. And I, I think John put something on display in the book Providence, which I have to tell you, I couldn't put down when I started reading it. And uh, I think it was 650 pages? 750. 750, okay. <laughs> well, whatever it was, I couldn't put it down until I finished it. And it, was, it is an epic work. Classically, as I would define it, it is biblical theology. It's an epic work saturated with Scripture, which is the truest thing I know about you is everything you think and feel is predicated on the Word of God. Your devotion to the Word of God comes through everything, and I think that's why you're so passionate about everything, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're not... You're making not, it up. You're not making it up. Like I said last <laughs> night, I hope you never say anything new. Yeah, right. That's right. But you're experiencing what I've discovered in my whole life, what I've experienced my whole life, the profound, almost... Um, almost um, unbearable joys of discovering truth in Scripture. Yep. And it just lights yep. a fire in your heart. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. we, we yep. express that a little differently. I keep my arms down. You put your arms up. Yeah. You, know, you know, I was thinking about, about miracles, and it just strikes me as I, as I look at these guys down here, what a miracle it is that they can keep their arms down. I mean, I just, I don't have that kind of control, so that's, that's obviously you believe in the supernatural here because they don't lift their hands. That's yes. amazing. Um, Mutual Admiration Society up here. What, you, you, I assume we're here because we're both old. But you're seven years older than I am. Now, that sounds like nothing when you're in your 70s and 80s, and it is, it is nothing in a sense of our friendship, I think. But once upon a time, it was significant because I became a pastor when I was 34. Now, at 34, you were 41. You'd been preaching for 20 years, <laughs> give or take, right? Yeah. More, so, so here I am, brand new, green as can be. I've preached 15 sermons, never married anybody, never buried anybody, and I became a, a pastor. And... Um, we had a breakfast. You won't remember this. John Salehammer was there. I was brand new. I was in Minneapolis. I can't remember why you were there. And I'm just picking your brain about pastoring. So I don't, I don't feel peer-like here. This is kind of a veteran to me, right? <laughs> and, and I'm the learner. So it may not look that way, but that's the way I have always felt, that I'm, uh, I'm deferring kind of to, to him. Because he, he, I mean, look how he's dressed. He's father-like. <laughs> And you have this, this, so, but that, that's kind of small, but sets the stage for admiration and appreciation of um, exposition without fail, 53 years, reformed. You know, you, you didn't always let that out, just like your Christian hedonism just came out. <laughs> you came to a conference at Bethlehem because... The reason I invited you is not because you're dispensational, pre-trib, that stuff, but rather because the last several books that you had published, you put Puritan sermons at the back. Mm -hmm. And I 
I, I just wonder, what is that? Why is he adding Puritan sermons at the back of his books? And so I invited you, suspecting that means he likes the Puritans. <laughs> and that means he's probably a closet Calvinist because he's not known for that, you know, like he is now. So at that meeting, you may remember this, about in our sanctuary, about 500 guys in a pastor's conference, time for Q&A, and I, I stand up and say, Pastor MacArthur, why, why do you put Puritan sermons at the back? And I can't remember what you said. I said, are you a five-point Calvinist? <laughs> this is in front of 500 guys. I've never heard him say this. And he said, yes. And I said, how come nobody knows that? And, and you said something like, well, the older you get, the more free you are to say what you think, or something like that. So expositional, reformed, staying in one place for 53 years, which I think is absolutely awesome for making a difference. And, 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 and having a global vision. So you, those are not alternatives. In, in a sense, to be a stationary, faithful pastor frees you, in a sense, to be globally impactful. And I've been to Russia, I've been to Brazil, everywhere I go, I run into little pockets of trainees that are tremendously impacted by you in this, in this school, in this, in this church. So that's that's huge. And one more thing. So I'm in his office the other day, yesterday, and uh, there's, there's candy on the desk. And, and uh, he tells me that he's got four great-grandchildren, and they're free to come in here and entertain themselves that way. And I know a little bit, not a lot, so I don't know all the sorrows that you've walked through, but you have a a marvelous legacy in your family. You really do. And that is an amazing thing, a precious thing. So those are a few. I could keep going, but... Well, I was just going to say regarding the great-grandchildren, I'm trying to move them from M&Ms to five-point Calvinism. That's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I need to do that because my oldest great-grandson, his name is John Owen MacArthur. So, I, I, I mean, if he turns out Arminian, I'm in deep <laughs> trouble. That just cannot happen. You know, John, I can answer the, the question about labels. <clears throat> I, I grew up in a sort of a Dallas seminary, Talbot seminary, dispensational uh, environment, Lewis Berry Chafer, um, and... Um, I mean, that was kind of my training, and I really became Reformed teaching the book of Matthew. Hmm. When I got to the Sermon on the Mount, I had all these dispensational commentaries, and they began to tell me that this stuff was all for some future kingdom, and it had nothing to do with the church age. And I started to dig a little deeper into that and found out there are even possibility of two different kinds of salvation. Uh, they made distinctions between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, all this. I, I, I was, I rejected all of it at the front end of the Sermon on the Mount. But my entire constituency couldn't have possibly understood if I'd have started talking like a five-point Calvinist and throwing labels around. I didn't want to cut the cords. I, I wanted to bring them along. And I thought the only way I can bring them along is to bring them along exegetically and expositionally without unpacking everything in labels that would put barriers up. So it took me a long time. Um, basically, uh, R.C. would ask me the same question, because I spoke at a Ligonier conference, and I was really outside their world, <laughs> totally outside their world. And I asked R.C., why are you doing this? I said, I want you to speak on election because I want to know what you believe. <laughs> that is absolutely the truth. The first time I was at a Ligonier, Ligonier conference, he, he gave me the subject of election, and I said, why are you doing that? You invented that doctrine. 
And he sat on the front row with his little glass of Coke and his feet crossed like this, waiting to hear what I said <laughs> at, at his own conference about election. And um, all I can say is I was prepared. <laughs> and that was my coming out on Calvinism. So in the process, I felt like I had an obligation to bring people who have been given a system that was superimposed on Scripture right. yep. to bring them out of that. And yep. I thought the labels too soon would short-circuit yep. yep. that. I think that's very wise. Yeah. Well, speaking of election and divine sovereignty, I, I want to go back to the book Providence that was mentioned earlier. Dr. Piper, you published that book last year, going through all of Scripture, drawing out the deep riches of the sweet doctrine of divine providence. Can you just tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write that book, the process of what that was like, and even the impact on you personally as a result of that study? Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, where do you start? We, we had both had very great families growing up, and um, my father would not have called himself a Calvinist, mm -mm. but he sure prayed like one, sure lived like one, mm -hmm. sure preached like one. Same with mine. Um, yeah, right, exactly. And, and so I cannot doubt that the seeds of that were sown. Another example would be my mother-in-law and father-in-law. He's gone and she's 100 years old. Um, when their 16-year-old son died in a car wreck, um, they did not like my Calvinism. I, they barely, I would barely be able to marry their daughter. Um, they acted just like Calvinists. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the mm -hmm. Lord. So I, I know that there are people who don't use the, the label, that they don't understand uh, election or predestination or effectual grace or limited atonement. They just don't get those pieces. And inside, they're really lovers of God's absolute sovereignty. And, and they act like it. So I grew up in that milieu, I think, and, and the seeds were, were sown. But I was an explicit free willer uh, across town here and at Fuller Seminary, and James Morgan, the systematics prof, was teaching systematics, and he was having a study Romans 9, and I wrote in the blue book at the end of that class for my exam, Romans 9 is like a tiger going around devouring free willers like me. <laughs> I remember standing outside his, his, his class, dropping my pen like this, I said this, and I said, I dropped it! God didn't drop it, I dropped it! That's my, that was my view of free will. <laughs> Foolproof argument. So my, my, whole, my whole world in the fall of 68 was turned upside down with the sovereignty of God, the God-centeredness of God with Jonathan Edwards and Dan Fuller, and my world changed. And from that day on, I knew this is all I want to talk about. This is what I want to write about. I want to write about the greatness of God, the centrality of God, the glory of God, because it had so revolutionized everything I thought. So that was there. And then as I began to write things, I just kept dreaming, I want to write a big book on sovereignty. I want to write a big book on sovereignty. And now that lasted about 40 years. Keep hoping and putting it off because I knew it would take a long time. It would be very hard and you procrastinate the hard things in life. And then I bought a paperback book, a paperback version of the NASB Bible, blue paperback. And I said, for several years now, I'm going to read through this Bible. And with a blue highlighter, I'm going to mark every text that looks like God's in control of whatever. Wow. And, and I got a yellow highlighter that said, I'm going to underline in yellow everything that looks like it's a problem for God to be in control. Well, it be, turned out to be a very blue book. <laughs> I handed that off about four years ago to the guys at Desiring God. I said, take all the blue texts and create a Word document for me. Just cut and paste from Logos or however you want to do it and give me that document. Hmm. And they did that for me and it turned out, I don't know, 60 or so single space pages of nothing but texts. 
Now you can do word searches, right? And so I took two summers, I forget which summers they were now, but I took a summer to Tennessee, about 14 weeks, and I organized those texts into groups. And you can see that in the, te- in the book, right? Yep. Sovereignty over death, sovereignty over birth, sovereignty over rulers, sovereignty over disease, sovereignty over... I just grouped these texts into groups and began to write. And the biggest surprise was not you asked, what did you learn in the process? Um, I intended to write a book on the extent and nature of the sovereignty of God. So how extensive is it? Does it control everything? And the nature of it, how how does he do it without Mm -hmm. messing up our accountability? And lo and behold, within the first five or six weeks, I realized I, I can't do it that way. Almost everything I start writing relates to the purpose of sovereignty. You can't talk very long about justifying sovereignty without talking about why is he doing what he's doing. So the first 180 pages are the purpose of sovereignty. And that created the name of the book. I thought it would be a book on sovereignty and it's a book on providence Mm -hmm. because providence is purposeful sovereignty. Mm -hmm. That's my definition anyway. So sovereignty is God can do anything he wants to do. Sit down and be quiet. He can do anything he wants to do. And that's true. Providence is he knows exactly what he's doing. He has purposes for doing it. They're infinitely wise. They're loving. They're good. And so... That's how the book took the shape that it did. And, and uh, books take on a life of their own. You start writing, you think you're going to write one book, and you write another one, or you write two. And then I took another summer to, to finish it up. That was pretty much the process. Amazing. In keeping with that theme of providence, can you... Tell us how God sovereignly worked in each of your lives to call you into pastoral ministry. Hmm. I know you both grew up in ministers' homes. Uh, You both embraced the Lord Jesus at an early age. My understanding, Dr. Piper, is that you were considering going into medicine, Hmm. and Dr. MacArthur, you were considering the world of athletics, and yet God had other plans. So can you just talk a little bit about how God's providence has manifested itself in your own preparation and call to ministry. Well, um, I think the, the, the primary impact on me with regard to the honorable character of ministry was the consistency of my own father. Hmm. Um, he was in the home in private in the car, in the backyard, on the golf course, exactly what he was in the pulpit, exactly what he was at the church. There was just one man who loved the Word of God, who loved to defend it. He was, he he very much loved apologetics. Um, He had the heart of an evangelist, did a lot of evangelism. He was an evangelist um, with the Fuller Foundation for a while. He was an evangelist uh, holding meetings back east with Moody. He did a lot of evangelism, so he had the heart of an evangelist, and uh, I can honestly say, and he died when he was 91, that I, I never saw in him any other man than the man that everybody knew. And I think that kind of consistency was the greatest treasure that could ever be given to me. And not everybody has that, because so many of our failures come out even though we endeavor to be faithful and confuse the people closest to us about the integrity of our lives. And if you're battling that, it doesn't seem like a very welcoming career choice because you're going to be on the the hot seat all the time. But I saw my dad embrace that with joy, with uh, passion, with zeal, with diligence. So, and I saw the same thing in my grandfather. So it always had a nobility to it. It it, it always had a consistency to it. And I think that was the foundation that made it easy for me to accept it when the Lord began to prompt my heart. Um, And in all honesty, I I don't think there was some moment when I got a call from heaven or anything. I just had in my heart the sense that that's where I would be. And it was 
basically solidified when I was thrown out of a car as a freshman in college going 75 miles an hour down a highway and slid on my back and was torn up pretty bad and ended up three months in bed. And I think at that point, I, my conversations with the Lord were, okay, whatever you want me to do, I give. Really, I mean, if you're going to throw me around, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> so I, there was a peace in my heart, a settled willingness at that point, maybe as a young kid, that this is what I needed to do, and, and I never looked back from, from that point. Um, I had other influences in my life that, men of integrity that validated that for me, uh, so there was, there was no hesitance. But I think the foundation was laid in the consistency of my father, supported by the devotion and love of my mother toward him. Mm -hmm. He was her shepherd, and I could see that. And so I saw that, that relationship at the most intimate level. So it was, always, it, it was always, to me, the highest and the best thing, and one could only w hope and wish that God would allow you to do that. <laughs> I, never, I never saw my father complaining about being in ministry. Obviously, mm -hmm. there were issues that the family would know about, but the, the high calling was kept high for me. And then he, my dad said, if, if you're serious about this, once I'd gotten athletics kind of behind me, he said, I, I want you to go to Talbot Seminary because there's a man there named Dr. Charles Feinberg. And uh, he's the most astute student of Scripture that I know. And, and my dad said, if you're serious, I want him to mentor you. So I went to Talbot, and I just, I just fed on every single thing he could provide, every class, every private conversation. Hmm. I became close to him, his wife, his kids. Paul and John Feinberg became my, my pals in seminary. So I just drew everything out of him. And this is another life of immense clarity and integrity that marked, left its mark on me. So there, there was no special occasion, but it was just, it just seemed the most natural thing for me to do. There was never any real resistance to that. Hmm, hmm, hmm. One common denominator is the father and, and, and then being thrown about by God until you can't do anything else. Um, the blessed summer of 1966. The longer I live, the more I bless God for 66. In fact, one day in particular, 6666. Six, <laughs> Ominous. I met Noel. I met my wife on that day, six, six, <laughs> sixty-six, and we, we we celebrate six, six. Um, that summer, I'm I'm in summer school taking chemistry on the way to a pre-med. God had made it so clear in May that medical school was His will for me. I mean, I felt deeply. And, and if I met my wife that summer. That's why I went to, that's why I took that detour to meet her. And we fell madly in love within days and had to wait two and a half years to get married, which is a big mistake. <laughs> that's one big blessed summer of 66. Number two, when people ask me, you're going to be a preacher like your dad? I would say, never going to happen. Because at, at age 12, 14, 15, 16, 18, I could not speak in front of a group. Mm. I was paralyzed. My voice would choke up, and I would, I would take lower grades in classes to avoid oral assignments, and I couldn't. It wasn't even an option. Summer of 66, Evan Welch, the chaplain of Wheaton, said to me, would you pray in summer school out loud in front of 500 people? And out of my mouth came, how long do you have to pray? And he said, 30 seconds, a minute. I cannot begin to explain why I said yes. <laughs> and I walked back and forth across front campus saying, I made a vow 
I think of only two vows in my life, because I think vows are really dangerous. I said, God, if you will just get me through 30 seconds <laughs> of praying in front of 500 people without choking up completely, I will never say no to a speaking engagement out of fear ever again. Mm. And I got through it. So that was number two. It broke. Something broke. I won the Clarence Roddy speaking, preaching award at Fuller Seminary two years later. I'm not surprised. So something broke yeah. in, in the summer of 66. And third, just like with your accident, I'm slapped in September in the hospital with mononucleosis. And I have to drop organic chemistry. And there goes my, my medical hmm. plan down the tubes. Meanwhile, Harold John Ockengay is speaking in chapel 200 yards away, and I'm listening on WETN radio, and everything in me says, I want to do that. I want to know the Bible like that. I want to handle the Bible like that. My poor wife, who I just bait and switched with, because she felt... <laughs> she, she fell in love with a pre-med student, and now... And, because her dad's a doctor, so she knew how that works. And, and she comes into my hospital room, and I say, I'm, I'm not going to go to medical school. I'm going to go to seminary because I want to do that. And, uh, and she said, I fell in love with you. Isn't that great? <laughs> Every, I tell you, marry the right woman. Guys, marry the right woman. Um, so those three things. I got, I got my wife in the summer of 66. I got free from paralysis in summer of 66. I got a call to the Word. One more step. So here I go to seminary. And the reason I came to Fuller is because there were palm trees in the pictures. <laughs> and I, I was just so tired of, of winters. And, and, and Providence is glorious. Then I head off to Germany, do my doctorate, get my, my first job. I just walked through the only door that opened, a door at Fo Bethel College to teach Bible. Six years later, October 14, 1979, like Pascal would say, fire at midnight. And God said, not this anymore, pastor it. I want you to preach Romans 9. I was writing a book on Romans 9, The Justification of God. Nobody knows this book, probably the most important book I ever wrote, Justification of God. And I'm writing a book about Romans 9, and God is saying, you believe Romans 9? Go see what it does in a local church. And so I resigned, and I asked my denominational official for guidance for a church, and he said, I know where you should be, downtown Minneapolis, Bethlehem. And they called me, and I was there for 33 years. So two, two points in the call, the call to the Word in the summer of 66 and the call to the pastorate in the fall of 1979, and they were both unmistakable, absolutely unmistakable. You know, I, I just to add a, a footnote to that, um, I never was early on compelled by the preaching. I was compelled by the opportunity to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, as a kid, I was frustrated with the traditional daily devotional mm -hmm. because I had too many questions. And I, I couldn't read for 15 minutes, shut the Bible, and walk away. I spent the rest of the day going over in my mind, what did it mean? Mm -hmm. And I was so driven, and I was, I, was, I was trying to, what's the secret to do this? I mean, I even read things by Thomas Akempis and E.M. Bounds, trying to, trying to find a mystical angle. I, I, I was searching all over the place. This is, this is like junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. But what appealed to me about seminary was at last... I can understand what the Bible means mm -hmm. for my own heart. And that carried on even to when I came here, that I wanted to go through the whole New Testament so I would know what it meant. And in the process, I'd be able to help other people. But the attraction of ministry was far more my whole life saturated in the Scriptures than it was the actual ministry side of it. And I don't know where that drive came from, I know it was, mm -hmm. it was helped by my father's view of Scripture mm -hmm. and Feinberg's view of Scripture. And if Scripture was what they believed it was, and, it, and I was convinced it was, then I must give my life to know this, and what God wants to do with it is up to Him. 
And even when I came here, I used to say, I was far more concerned about the depth of my understanding of Scripture than the breadth of my ministry. Right. And that's always been the case. Right, right. So let's drill down a little bit on those early years of pastoral ministry. We have men graduate from the seminary here, and as they go out to take a pastorate, they are wondering how they can be most effective in the service of Christ and the service to his people. As you think back to your early years at Bethlehem and at Grace, what words of wisdom would you have for a new pastor who's looking ahead to the first five years of ministry? You go. <laughs> um, cultivate a love for the scriptures and a love for God and a love for people. Mm -hmm. And um, f focus on the reality of the text. Um, Sinclair and I were talking about the danger among some of loving the text more than you love what the text is about. And I think that makes for a, either a pedantic ministry or a short-term ministry. And therefore, the, what, what you want to do is to penetrate through the Bible to the reality of what the text is about and that means having an impulse like John MacArthur's where you read a devotional and not all day long you're asking questions about it. What about this? What about this? What about this? Until you get through words to reality. And your people will know whether you are real. You're real and you've seen real. Or whether you're just performing, whether this is an academic exercise, whether you're just a lecturer on theology, or whether you've met God, you know God, you've seen something glorious, and you want them to see what you've seen. So I think that would be the front end of my, my plea, is that push through texts to see reality, which is the, mainly God himself, know him, love him, delight in him, be satisfied in him, so that it's obvious to the people that you are exulting in him as you preach his word. And of course, that involves prayer, because as you push into text, you're just crying out, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things out of your law, incline my heart to your testimony, satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love. So, so prayer and thoughtfulness about the word move you into the reality of communion with God and then you stand in the pulpit and you exult over the text as you draw people to it. I don't ever think you should, you should do an end run around the words. They'll, they'll catch on to that, mm -hmm. you know, put a system on it or put your experience on it, put a story on it, or put some movie on it, or put some put cultural event on it, and you put it on. Instead, you're saying in the first half of verse 25, it says, on that day, a fugitive. Pause, explain some things, push in, move on. They can see you, you're getting your reality in and through the, the text. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, I would, I would affirm all that. I think um, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of things as I think about the early years. One of the things that I tell young people is the first thing you have to understand is they're not impressed with what you know. They want to find out if you love them. Um, they, they, want to, they want your heart. And in that kind of preaching, your heart for the Lord comes through. And for, for me, since God's clearest revelation of himself was Christ, I wanted to go immediately to Christ because people would argue about church polity, they would argue about theology, but, but you really can't argue about Christ. And you get in the Gospels, and I did that early on, and it's just Christ every week, month after month after month after month after month, the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. And he, he literally dominates the church. So years in the Gospel of John, when I first came then, nine years in Matthew, nine or 10 years in Luke, five years in Mark, 
back to three or four years in John. So 25 years or more of my 50 years here was Christ every week, every week, every week, every week, every week. And, you know, this is because early on I was captured by 2 Corinthians 3.18 as we gaze at His glory, we're changed into His image by the work of the, the Holy Spirit. And if the work of sanctification is to conform us to Christ, we have to know what Christ is. We have to focus on Him. And, and so, again, that's why Paul says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So it always seemed to me that, that the most irresistible thing I ever had to say would be to show them Christ. And even when you're going, I mean, it's Christ in the Old Testament. I remember when we finished the whole New Testament, I asked some people, what should we do now? And they said, could we, could we, the whole New Testament, could we go to the Old Testament and, and see Christ in the Old Testament? And it's like the game, once you know what Waldo looks like, you can find him. So we knew what Christ looked like. And so I did a long series of Christ in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that, they said, can we, can we do the Gospel of John again? So I did the Gospel of John again. So I think the, the combination of the exaltation that you're talking about, John, I, I'm lifted when I'm talking about Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm elevated. I'm, um, I'm energized. Uh, and what comes through is it's not about yelling or style. It's about intensity and passion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and joy and all of that. And I, I just found Christ to be absolutely ir irresistible. And all I wanted to do as a, as a pastor was hide behind Him. Just, just hide behind Him and make them engage with Him in the text. Bore down, as you said, dig down clear the clutter, uh, and let Christ put Himself on display by His Spirit in the minds and the hearts of the people. And along with that, a great measure of patience, because people in a church are at whatever point they're at when you arrive, because somebody they cared about took them there. And you may think they don't have the right ecclesiology or the right theology or they need correction. The worst thing you can do is impose that on them. You haven't earned the right to do that. You've got to take them there through the pages of Scripture until they affirm in their own hearts the truth. So what you're doing when you exposit Scripture is not simply telling them what a text means. You're showing them why it can only mean that. Amen. There's no other possibility that could mean anything but that, and now the text has gripped their heart. And as you do that, week after week, month after month, they're conformed to sound doctrine and to Christ-likeness. And in the process, you're patiently loving them through that. And I think I saw that first in Christ, who was saying the same things to His disciples at the end of three years that He said at the front end like, oh, you have little faith. I mean, they didn't progress very well. They were still arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom at the end, like they didn't get the main point. Um, and they, they were ridiculous when it all came to the trial and the cross, and they were all over the place, obviously, completely disconnected from the reality they should have known. So I understood even for Jesus, it's hard to move people from where they are to where they need to be. Even if you're the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find a massive amount of disappointment with the people in whom you invest the most. So be really patient. Um, and I think our Lord gave us a great hint when He said, it's better for you that I go away because the Spirit has been with you in me but will be in you. And that, that catapults you to another level of reality, spiritually speaking. So I, I think patience as you unpack the Scripture as they interact with the Word of God itself. And you're just, you're, you're just the, the, the guy that shines the light on the text to let the text live and do its work. Amen. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, talking about the church and society, 
When we look back at the Puritans, we see that they ministered at a time when those in governing authority were hostile to the truth. They persecuted the church. We have great examples in the Puritans of pastors who spoke boldly God's truth to those in power. I know in 2013, Dr. Piper, you preached a message that you directed part of to President Obama on the subject of abortion entitled, No, Mr. President. And Dr. MacArthur, last week, you wrote an open letter to Governor Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, calling him to repentance. So I wanted to ask you men to comment on the church's role as the conscience of the nation, and maybe more specifically, the pastor's role in speaking God's truth to those in power. Mm, mm, mm. Well, first of all, some categories. We, we understand that there are divisions of responsibility in the economy of God in the world. There is government, and government has a role. There is the family, and the father, the parents have a role. Um, and uh, the church doesn't become the father to the family. It's not the parents, and the church is not the government, and the government cannot rule the church. I mean, we, we talked about that. We did a document, Christ is head of the church, not Caesar. But at the same time, the church informs everybody of what that role means. We tell the parents how to parent. We tell the government how to govern because it's laid out in Scripture. Uh, so the division of authority doesn't mean that we sit back and let the government be whatever it wants to be or let parents be whatever they want to be. We have to bring the, the Word of God to bear. The Bible is crystal clear that, that whoever rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, for example. So we're always going to be the conscience of the, the family, the conscience of parents, individuals, uh, and the government. So that's just a kind of a categorical way to look at it. Um, what I've seen in the evangelical movement for the last 20 years or so when evangelicals have gotten into politics is that they are very busy trying to manipulate the political picture. They, they want to go to Washington and they want to set up organizations that lobby with politicians. Um, you, you even hear, I think it was Tim Keller who made some statements about we have a, um, a, an urban mandate to speak to the cities. Well, the urban mandate, for example, is it'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you if you've heard the gospel and rejected it. The urban mandate is to pronounce judgment on the rejection of Christ on every city that does that. Um, and the responsibility for the church is not to so somehow gain favor with the government by lobbying, which leads to compromise which leads to compromise that is so severe and so bad that it can take a large denomination and fragment the whole thing into chaos. We've just watched that play out. The church has to speak gospel truth. We have to do this. We have to talk about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, that God has a righteous standard. You have exhibited the inability to live up to that standard. You are under judgment. We, we, don't have the, we don't have the political power to move the government. The only hope for a government is, the only hope for a quiet and peaceful life and godliness is to pray for the salvation of the ruler, 1 Timothy 2. So it just struck me that I hadn't seen this done. and. I mean, we've done things like that. I had written letters before to the state Congress about certain homosexual issues. But it seemed to me when, when the governor decided to quote Jesus to support abortion that he had gone off the edge, and I, I was terrified for his eternal soul. I had met him. I did a Larry King program with him. Um, I mean. I don't know if that's too far. I don't know what God has in mind for him. But the people following him, a whole state full of people and all the people around him in government, I, I felt the, the, 
the only weapon that we have is, is righteousness, sin or self-control, and the threat of judgment, and to call them to salvation. It probably should have been done sooner. I probably should have done that maybe years ago. But zeal for your house has eaten me up, you know, the psalmist said, and then Jesus quoted that when he cleansed the temple. And I, it just seemed to me that I couldn't, I was, I was just shocked that a man would use the words of Jesus to support the slaughter of the ones who are created in the image of God. So it activated that. Um, and my goal, I, I, I would, I'm praying, and our whole church is praying, that, that he would bow the knee to Christ and be mm -hmm. saved. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are political solutions. And I think what happens when people try to find political solutions, they compromise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think those categorical distinctions you made, I would agree with. And so I've been pondering, um, since uh, these questions were sent to me last night, this one exercised me the most. Um, why you got to a point where you did that, and why I got to a point in 2013 where I did what I did toward Obama. Because you don't write a letter every week, and you could. Because there's enough craziness going on by a lot of people <laughs> that you could write a letter to every congressman or every governor or, or the president every day on a, on a different issue, and you would be justified in doing so by declaring, thus saith the Lord. Um, and so in principle that it's right for any Christian to speak the Word of God. If the Bible says something, say it. <laughs> say it at the PTA meeting. Say it in the town square. Say it at the legislative meeting. Say it where, wherever you are. Say what God says. And, and then you distinguish. We, we don't necessarily move in behind that, spoke and, and, and use every political agency possible to coerce that event. That's not what you're saying. So I'm back to my question. So what happened? And you just said what happened. He quoted Jesus to support the slaughter of babies, and it just pushed you over the edge. What Obama said in 2013 was this. He said, I want my daughters, now they're little girls at this time, I want my daughters to have as much reproductive freedom as men. Do you know what that means? Sure. I want them to be able to have sex yeah. as much as with they no want with no consequences, like boys don't have any consequences. And the only way that girls can have no consequences is abortion. That's the issue. I want my daughters to have free sex. I was so furious at that treatment of his daughters that that just pushed me over the edge. So there's, I, I don't have any, any um, formula here for when a pastor gets pushed over the edge. <laughs> I, I really do want to discourage you from being over the edge every Sunday because <laughs> it will so contaminate no, yeah. the preaching of the Word of God that you will be known as a political animal or a worse, a partisan animal. And as soon as this, this church is known or this pastor is known for being mainly a, a political activist or a partisan in the political activism, I think your prophetic authenticity goes down. We want to be able to stand and, and say to Republicans or Democrats, black and white, the truth. Yeah. And the only way to do that, I think, is being careful about not being too politically entangled. That's really, really right. So somehow, it is possible, I'm, I'm thinking of pastors now, it is possible, I mean, if you go on, on Desiring God website, I've addressed just about every hot bustion issue there is um, at some point along the line, like Confederate memorials. What are we gonna say about that, you know? Should they all come down? And so on. So. CRT, you name it. I've written articles, but I think my people and those who are around me just don't think of me that way. They don't think of me as mainly a political guy. They think of me as a Christian hedonist. They think of me as a Calvinist. They think of me as a, a happy warrior for Reformed theology who wants the people to get out of hell and into heaven and rejoice in God when all 10 of their children die. 
That's, that's what they think. And I, I don't know how you do that exactly. So I, I'm saying, say what needs to be said about the current issue that your people are dealing with, and then speak the whole counsel of God Sunday after Sunday so you're known as a Bible guy. Yeah, yeah. As we look ahead in American culture, speaking about this same subject, it seems as if things are getting more and more hostile to biblical Christianity. The Puritans, of course, dealt with persecution. They dealt with hostility. For us as American Christians, how can we begin to prepare for the persecution that may very well be coming? Well, I think we have to anticipate it. Um, wh whatever vestiges of Judeo-Christian ethics or whatever vestiges of Christianity were, were still in the, in the culture have, have, have been evacuated. They're gone. I, I wouldn't even call this a postmodern culture. I would call it a pre-Christian culture. Pre? Pre-Christian. This is like paganism 2.0. Okay. I it's see. as if Jesus never came. Yep. It's as if there never was a cross and a resurrection and a New Testament and a church and, and a Bible. Th this, is, this is like Rome or like Molech worship or Baal worship. Th this is blatant paganism. And um, it, it is a kind of paganism that has levers to control everything with the control of the technology and social media. Um, what, this, what the current zeitgeist in the world hates most is the truth. I'll give you an illustration. We won our case with the COVID lockdowns with the county and the city. There were 12 different hearings that they set up for us. The judge in our case was a man married to a man. So-called married. Yeah. But he wasn't any ally of ours, that's what I'm saying. So, and yet, he kept postponing the 12 times. He postponed the case because he says, until you guys settle the First Amendment issue, we can't go to the merits of this case. So he kept pushing it back to the Constitution. Finally, in frustration, because I was being given a jail sentence every week and a fine, and they were all mounting and accumulating. And um, finally, our attorney said, we want to depose the health department. We want to depose the top three officials in the LA health department. Our, our lawsuit was against the governor of the state, the county, and all of that. So we said, we're going to depose the health officials. In 24 hours, they dropped all charges, all fees, all fines, and paid all legal bills, almost to a million dollars because the one thing they couldn't cope with was the truth. And that's the truth about COVID. They could not let that out. So they're trying to control everything to sustain the narrative. They don't even want you to, they don't want, the, the, the governor just is in the process of signing in California a bill that would Basically say, if you're a medical doctor in California and you go against the current narrative, you can lose your license. So they're trying to control everything. If they want to control those kinds of things, then how welcome, how much welcome will they give to the truth of Scripture? Virtually nothing. So I, I think it's a short step from controlling narratives about political issues and social issues and structural issues and education and medicine and whatever and whatever to shutting down the spiritual and, and the biblical. So I think that's coming. Um, and that's, I mean, that's going to be fish or cut bait, right? That's going to be, I mean, you're going to have to pick sides then. You're either going to be faithful or you're going to compromise. I saw this week that one church opened up after 900 days of being closed. That's, that's rolling over in a pretty extreme way. 
But, but I think we are going to, the evangelical church, the, the faithful biblical church is going to very soon become the target because we don't accept anything. Vanderbilt Hospital has a gender reassignment surgery, big part of their operation. You may have seen about it. Um, they, they will brutalize, uh, they will maim young girls and young boys. Um, and the head of the hospital, there's a video, basically said, anybody on the staff who doesn't agree with that, get another job. And then they hired a bunch of homosexual advocates to go with every child that comes in to talk to a physician. They send a, an activist so that the doctor can't talk the child out of having their breasts cut off. This is a hospital that's a historic medical school. Um, I just don't know, in a, in, a, in a culture like that, where Christianity becomes anything but the arch enemy of everything, of everything. And I, and I think, you know, we've had a couple of hundred years in America when it's been different than most of history and most of the world. That's right. That's right. But, but we're there. Yeah. This is a pagan country. And, and they don't want to be confronted with biblical truth. And there's going to be some price to pay. I'm, I'm confident of that. We have to be ready for that, and we have to be faithful. And then we have the joy of watching the hand of God and providence do what it's going to do. And the end has already been written, and uh, the Lord will triumph. This, this country is now ruled by fear. And when people are afraid, they want somebody to protect them and, and help them. The, the primary fear from all that I can see is physical, physical death, physical health, safety, physical well-being. And now you've got the medical profession turned on its head where they're, they want to kill your baby in your womb or they want to act like Frankenstein on your 13-year-old or they, they want to withhold medication when you go to the hospital because Big Pharma controls them. So when, you, when you're living in a materialistic environment like this where everything comes down to protecting your physical well-being, and television is like a thousand commercials in a row for medication, but the whole medical world is, is now under the control of people who want to do evil and have no compunctions about killing. And if you think that's odd, remember, I saw the latest statistics that 71 million people were killed through World War II. In what world do you kill 71 million people? And they were largely killed, with the exception of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the A-bombs, they were largely killed by bombs that could kill hundreds, but mostly by guns that killed one at a time. So this is an evil world, and it has a massive capacity to kill and maim because its father is, is, a, is a killer and a liar. So I think cultural protections have been pulled away. We, we, we're, we're now... We're now where the early church was. Uh, I said, you know, Governor Newsom is, is Herod. He wants, he wants to make sure he goes through this state and kills all the little ones. And, and he, he, would be, he will be reelected here. And people can't make the connection that if he's willing to kill all the little ones in the womb, and maim people? Do you think he cares about you? So this is a this is a this is like paganism 2.0 to me. So we have to expect to have the level of hostility that paganism gives when it dominates a culture, and Christianity is is the most severe threat that it faces. Jesus said it this way. He said. The world hates me because I tell them their deeds are evil. 
And if they hated me, they'll hate you. If you tell them, if you stop telling them how wonderful they are, if you, if you stop the sentimental slop that you hear from Joel Osteen and the prosperity preachers, and you tell them their deeds are evil, and they are in need of Jesus Christ and He alone who can save them from eternal hell, they'll hate you. And that hate is going to show up in the same kinds of hostility that is, has been characteristic of other periods of time in other places. So this is a, this is a, this is a really... I, I was saying the other day to somebody, this, uh, this is a hard time to be a post-millennialist. It's, it's, um, th this is not going that direction fr from what I can tell. Um, but it's also a terribly hard time to be a pragmatist. How do you win this world? You, you, you want the world to like you? You want the world to come to your church? You, you, you want to turn your church into a rock concert? And you, you want to turn yourself into some kind of slick sort of comedian, TED Talk guy, because you want everybody to like you and you want to win the world, you want to reach the world. You connect with this world, this culture, it'll drag you to the bottom. They're not going to be content just to take your music. They're going to want to take your... They're, they're going to take everything. So you're going to wind up with having to affirm homosexuality, transgenderism, Divorce, adultery, you name it, because that's their life. So pragmatism worked ostensibly, superficially, obviously not genuinely, but it, it's megachurches flourished in becoming as much like the world as they could. Um, th this is a hard time to, to pull that off. Be because you almost have to undo everything. If you're going to keep that relationship alive, you can't tell the truth. But if you tell the truth, you can't keep it, you can't sustain it. So, uh, th but this is the time for the faithful to stand up, right? And I read the end of the book and we win. Yeah. Um. In answer to the question, what, how do you help people get ready for this, my, my answer would be we should have started a long time ago, like from the very first sermon you came to your church. You teach your people that you are not first Americans, you're first Christians, and you're aliens and you're exiles on planet Earth, yeah. and this world owes you nothing, and you may expect suffering. And that should be preached when things are going as well as they can possibly mm -hmm. go, because it's built into the nature. So in a sense, I'm a little uncomfortable with painting the narrative of the present moment as so extraordinary that that's the reason we need to be ready. And I don't know whether you intended that, but I, I would want from the get-go, for 50 years, you help people see Life is hard. You're going to suffer. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. This is just plain biblical teaching. It's not peculiar to America. All over the world, people are suffering. And that would be true if America were heaven and on earth. So you, I want to prepare martyrs. I want people to go to the hardest places of the world. So my answer to how you preach is that you, you preach the sovereignty of God you preach the fact that suffering is to be expected. You preach the flip side of prosperity theology. The problem with prosperity theology is that it lacks a doctrine of suffering. And so, pastors, you want to build into your people capacities to suffer and not by be a, a, a child born who can't talk ever and you'll be caring for this child for the next 30 years, or it might be persecution. You don't know what it might be. So I, I think the kind of preaching that the church needs is just First Peter, 
through and through. Yeah. You preach what the Bible says about suffering. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for uh, great is their reward in heaven. Rejoice in that day and be glad. So, so the, the, um, I, I know that you believe this, but that what you just did for the last 10 minutes there, I think can have an effect of making people angry and sowing seeds of, mm, how, how do you turn that? So I'll, I'll stop with the question. How do you turn that back to Christian hedonism? Because the last thing we sure. want is for people to walk out of church on Sunday seething with anger at their culture. That's the dominant emotion that they have. I want them thrilled with the sovereignty of God, thrilled that they're saved, thrilled that they have meaning in life rooted in the gospel, thrilled that no matter what happens in this world, they're going to be able to walk in the truth and joy. And, and so there, there's a, a concern in, in my heart that the way to get ready for suffering is to namely narrate how bad things are, which is what you just did. And I know that if you were preaching right there on Sunday, you'd have a text open in front of you and you would be leading people into and around and up yeah, and to God. My point in saying that is that the times have changed. I mean, it's different for us in America now than it was in terms of the tolerance of Christianity. That's all I'm saying. But the way I've always approached suffering, and you can't get away from it if you're expositing the Scripture all the time, is to go back to James 1, count it all joy when you fall into various trials because they have a perfecting work. Or take the words of Peter, after you've suffered a while, the Lord make you perfect. God's greatest work is done in our suffering, and that's, that's in the fabric of, of all of the teaching of the New Testament. Um, so on the one hand, I'm assessing, I think, what you said is so important. I'm simply saying it's different today, and there are things that the church has gotten away with that you're not going to be able to get away with anymore and still be faithful because there's such hostility toward the truth. But at the same time, you not only prepare to suffer, but you prepare to see God do His best work in the suffering. Um, and I think the longer we live, John, we, we would look back and see that the, the times when we suffered the most, we drew most near to Him. Right. No doubt about it. Bringing this conversation full circle back to the theme of the conference, the Puritan Conference. How have the Puritans in particular shaped your life and ministry? I know, Dr. MacArthur, I've heard you talk through the years about Thomas Watson and Stephen Charnock. Dr. Piper, even in your message last night, you talked about John Owen, John Howe, and of course the American Puritan, Jonathan Edwards. So how have these faithful figures from church history, how have they impacted you? Yeah. Well, if you're going to if you're going to include Jonathan Edwards with the Puritans, the answer is immeasurably. Um, nobody outside the Bible that I am aware of has had a greater impact on me than Jonathan Edwards. And I'll just mention three steps in that. I was in a classroom, fall of 1968. Dan Fuller was speaking clearly, precisely, and rationally about God the class was full of psych students who didn't like this. So they were raising their hands. Why are you so rational? Why don't you get more practical and emotional? And Dr. Fuller said, why can't we be like Jonathan Edwards, who could be writing a philosophical treatise that would bend the minds of the greatest intellects and break into a paragraph that would thrill your grandmother's godly soul. And I was out of my chair. I, I was just on my way to the library. I've only heard Jonathan Edwards mentioned in one context, sinners in hand in the name of God. I don't have any idea that he had said anything like that. And 
The book I found was The End for Which God Created the World. That book changed the world for me. It just turned everything upside down because the point was God uh, is very God-centered and does everything he does for the glory of God. I had learned I'm supposed to do everything for the glory of God. I didn't know God did everything for the glory of God, and my world changed. So that was step number one. Step number two was the freedom of the will. There is no greater book on the planet about the freedom of the will, which doesn't exist, <laughs> than Jonathan Edwards. Doesn't exist with this definition, and let us be precise. We are Puritans, we serve a precise God. Ultimate human self-determination is what does not exist. And that's what most people mean by freedom of the will, though they don't say it to themselves. And that book settled that issue for me. I mean, it was just phenomenal. David Wells says it is, it is a watershed book. It's like if you read that book, you come down one way or the other, and the argument is over. And third, I'm sitting in a rocking chair in Munich, Germany, every Sunday night. There are no services Sunday night, and I'm reading for months, just a few pages at a time, The Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards, and my soul is being shredded shredded, and my, which interestingly enough has been one of my responses to the people who say he was a slaveholder, Piper. He was a slaveholder. And I say, I didn't know that for the first 20 years that I read him, and now I've known it for a long time. I've grieved over it. I've struggled with it. And, and one of my responses, you can read my longer response at Desiring God, um, is I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to countenance that. I, I don't know what kind of loopholes there I don't know. I don't know what that was like, but this I know. Nobody has broken me, humbled me, laid me low, and undisposed me to racism like Jonathan Everett. I can't not say it. I can't not believe it. I, that's just reality. I can't not say that reality, that reading the religious affections, especially the chapter on evangelical humiliation. So those three books, those three stages uh, would be my answer to the question, how has that Latter-day Puritan affected me? Is totally... I think my first um, really serious impact from the Puritans was uh, Charnock, The Existence and Attributes of God. I, I, I couldn't even comprehend that you could say that much about God. That's, uh, that's how limited I was. Um, I thought, you know, if you read The Knowledge of the Holy, which is about that thick, you got it. This was, this was a revolution. And I think um, the, the, the Puritans had the ability, and I'll mention this probably later in my little talk, but the, the Puritans had the ability to go on and on and on and on and on and on and never really escape the confines of a text. It's not like they were springboarding. It was there. It was in there. And that, that's, that's what I saw. And all I wanted was the text, the text, the text. I just want to know what it means and what it says. And, and I found they were, they exhausted me mm -hmm. with the, the possibilities and intricacies and depths. And I, I discovered that in Charnock. Um, I mean, there are many things I liked about them. Um, I remember flying from Peru one night reading Thomas Watson on the Beatitudes and um, reading the Body of Divinity and certain other things, but I think it was my exposure to Charnock that showed me what minimal things I really understood about God and opened up just vast um, realities to me. Um, you know, at the time, I had been a little bit influenced by a preaching style that was taught at Dallas Seminary, where you're not allowed to leave the text. If you read Haddon Robinson, you're sort of confined to the text, and you find a main point, and you find the subpoints, and you connect, and you don't go anywhere else. And 
I, I couldn't do that. Because I, I, everything I read in the text made me think of something else in the text, Analogia Scriptura. I was bouncing all over the place. And this is, what, this is what my heart was telling me, and I think Stephen Chernock legitimized my heart's desire to take what was there and to find every possible thing in Scripture that elucidated yes, yeah. or yeah. illustrated it. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's impossible to stay at the text. Impossible. Right. Not, it's not a choice. Because you have to know an author's larger worldview to understand any sentence. And there aren't enough sentences within a paragraph to do that. Right. You, you cannot take the text, practice hospitality, and preach a Christian sermon on it from the text. You can't. You have to go elsewhere to find out what should motivate Christian hospitality. What's the goal of Christian hospitality? What's the manner of Christian hospitality? How does Christian hospitality relate to the cross? How does it relate to heaven? How does it relate to hell? You can't preach that way. Don't kid yourself. So whatever they were doing at that seminary, <laughs> it's impossible. You have to know other realities that an author has in his head besides the sentence he just spoke or you cannot understand the sentence. And, and I think what, what drives it for me, and I know it does for you, because I can hear it in your preaching, you're not done with that test, text until you're done asking questions of that text. You just, what about that? Well, if, the, if that's the case, then what about this? Well, how does that connect with this? Well, if you say that, then what about this text over here that seems to say something different? So for me, the preparation of a sermon is to run myself through that text until I've run out of questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, which and the, they're not all answered in that text. Right, which inevitably leads, and we, I think we talked about this earlier and it would be a good thing to say in regard to Puritans, leads to um, doctrinal formulations Absolutely. about what's in that text. Instead of just saying the words of the text, but rather to say, now, how does that fit in here and here and here of reality about God and Christ and faith and obedience? How does it work? And that leads you to doctrines. And so I, I think what, what you've modeled and, and I think increasingly well over the years and what I've tried to do and, and I think what Puritans did masterfully was you preach textually and doctrinally. Yes. You're, after five years or so, your people should have some idea what your theology is. Unlike the denominational official who told me when I was about to preach on Romans 9, and, and I was worried at the time about whether it would blow the church up, he said, oh, I think it's possible to preach on Romans 9 so that the people don't know what you think. <laughs> he said that. That's a curse on the church. So don't let, let them know what you think about depravity when you've got a text on sin. I mean, it, it, people, people don't have any idea what's in your head. And they have little teeny views of their own depravity. They don't know what, what, they, what they're talking about. And you, you've got to take the text and you've got to draw out those connections so that it, it gets really serious and weighty and they have some doctrinal sense of, of the truth that's behind the text. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. That... <laughs> Left me speechless. <laughs> um, Another wanna, question. Well, we're actually out of time. I, I wish this conversation could keep going because I'm enjoying it so much. But thank you both, Dr. Piper and Dr. MacArthur. It is so rich to hear you explain these truths.
I'm going to ask Dr. MacArthur if you would pray for us, and then after you pray, John Martin's going to come and lead in a closing song. I thank you, Lord, for a friend in life and ministry like John, and thank you for the impact he's had on my life and on so many because of the continuing impact you've had in and through him. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have all that we need in it. And if we give our whole lives to it, we can be faithful, useful servants and hear, well done. I pray, Lord, that you'll keep John strong and give him many years continuing ministry. And I pray the same for all who serve you in this place. Increase our love for the truth written and the truth incarnate. May we live for love and affection. May we love you more, love your word more, love people more, love the church more, love the lost more. May we be marked by love. May the proof of our sound doctrine not be kind of doctrinaire, dogmatic assurance, but may it be a humble love that exhibits patience and grace. Bless us as we wrap up the day and, and the wonderful conference. We thank you for Dr. Beakey and his leadership and all the people who have taught and led and served. We're just profoundly grateful. This, this has been a high point for all of us, a, a moment of um, rich grace that has been deposit, deposited in every life here, for which we are now accountable and responsible. M may this be a life-transforming few days, and may it show up in the way we love and serve in the future, we pray. Amen. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Amen.